Hello, hello, and welcome everybody. What are we doing? We are reading. Last time we finished, we were at, we had the second half and finished. I'm looking over over next to me for my notes because I'm not very good at remembering titles of specific things when I need to. We finished the Nuremberg Stove by Weda. It was only a two-part reading because it's a fairly short story, and it was about a little boy who had grown up after many generations of his family, with having a particular ceramic stove that warmed their house and kept their family happy and warm. Um, and it got sold because they were, the family was really poor and he was determined to rescue it or at least save it or find out where it was going to. And so we found out all about that. Um, the story started in Austria and I think finished in southern Germany, but I'm not sure. You could look it up if you want, see if you can find out. Uh, but this time we are going to be reading, even though it's November the 5th here in New Zealand and technically Guy Fawkes Day, we are not reading an English story. We are reading a Swiss story. We are reading Heidi by Joanna, Johanna, Johanna Spiri. Not the way I grew up saying it. For some reason, us as kids pronounced her name Spry, S-P-R-Y even though it's spelt S-P-Y-R-I, Spiri, according to all the German pronoun pronoun people who say things, you know, whatever. So we're reading Heidi by Johanna Spiri this time, and I'm not too sure how long it's going to take us, but it is a classic. There's a lot of us who've grown up hearing it or seeing it. There, are, there was a Shirley Temple movie of it done, I think, um, and I think for a lot of people especially older generations, the, the picture that they have in their minds of what Heidi looked like is the one that Shirley Temple portrayed. Anyway, so hello, if you're new here, I'm Jev. I read old-fashioned children's stories, just like bedtime stories, but it doesn't have to be bedtime and you don't have to be a child to listen. Um, they're not like audiobooks because, as you can tell already, I make mistakes, I interrupt myself and that sort of stuff. The recordings I refer to over on YouTube as rough reads because of this. I don't chat while I'm reading the a, a chapter of the book, so but you're welcome to type in the chat box if you want. Uh, but I won't respond to those until I get to a chapter break. And then we'll take a break. I'll have a drink of water. You can have a snack if you want. Well, you can actually drink and snack as much as you want all the way through because I can't hear it. Um, but if I'm going to, that's when I will do those things. And then we will carry on with the rest of the story. The interruptions within a chapter that I will give you are usually about things that I might be aware of that you might not be. Things that I grew up understanding or even experiencing myself sometimes. Not always, I'm not that old. Uh, but I did grow up reading and my the same some of the same books that my parents read and my great grandparents read and I realized that that is a whole other world that a lot of people these days don't get to experience especially if you go to the library and try and get one of these books out and discover that they have new books there not old books anymore uh, one of the advantages that we still have is that you can go to to a website called Project Gutenberg and the actual web address is gutenberg.org, and I'm going to type that in for you in case you want. And you can look up these books and then borrow them or keep or download them for yourself. So it's gutenberg.org, and it's free. There you go. Um, so glad that you can be here, so glad that you can listen, and I'm going to read, and we'll see how far we get. Um, I was hoping for a nice day where I didn't have to wear my cardigan today, but it's gone all gluggy and wet outside and a little bit damp and a bit cold, so we'll see how we go. I may have to take the cardigan off later. I'll rattle around and hopefully do it in a, a chapter break. Anyway, that is not important. We're going to read. I'm reading Heidi. By Joanna Spiri, and we are reading Chapter 1, Heidi's First Mountain Climb. On a bright June morning, two figures, one a tall girl and the other a child, could be seen climbing a narrow mountain path 
that winds up from the pretty village of Mayenfeld to the lofty heights of the Alm Mountain, ALM. In spite of the hot June sun, the child was clothed as if to keep off the bitterest frost. She did not look more than five years old, but what her natural figure was like would be hard to say, for she had on apparently two dresses, one above the other, and over these a thick red woolen shawl. Her small feet were shod in thick nailed mountain shoes. That's probably very heavy leather with maybe a wooden sole, I'm not sure. When the wayfarers came to the hamlet known as Dorfley, which is situated halfway up the mountain, they met with greetings from all sides, for the elder girl, Ilda, not Alda, elder girl was now in her old home. As they were leaving the village, a voice called out, Wait a moment, debtor. If you are going on up the mountain, I will come along with you. Thus, the girl thus addressed stood still, and the child immediately let go of her hand and seated herself on the ground. Are you tired, Heidi? asked her companion. No, I'm hot, answered the child. We shall soon get to the top now. You must walk bravely on a little longer and take good long steps, and in another hour we shall be there, said Detta. We are, they were now joined by a stout, good-natured old woman. They were not. They were now joined by a stout, good-natured-looking woman who walked on ahead with her old acquaintance, with Detta, um, obviously meant to be followed by Heidi. And where are you going with the child? asked the one who had just joined the party. I suppose it is the child your sister left. Hmm, okay. Yes, answered Detta. I'm taking her up to Uncle where she must stay. This child may stay up there with the Elm Uncle, or with Elm Uncle, you must be out of your senses, Detta. How can you think of such a thing? The old man, however, will soon send you both packing off home again. Hmm, sounds like he's not actually a particularly sociable person, does it? He cannot very well do that, seeing that he is her grandfather. He must do something for her. I have had charge of the child till now, and I can tell you, Barbel, I am not going to give up the chance which has just fallen to me of getting a good place for her sake. That would be all very well if he were like other people, said Barbel. But you know what he is, and what he can do with a child, especially one so young. The child cannot possibly live with him, but where are you thinking of going yourself? Nothing untoward, untoward just that he is very, very involved with his own life and not particularly sympathetic to children. There you go. Uh, where are you thinking of going yourself? To Frankfurt, where, a good extra, uh, where an extra good place awaits me, answered Detta. I am glad I am not the child, explained Barville. Not a creature knows anything about the old man up there. He will have nothing to do with anybody and never sets his foot inside the church. From one year's end to another, when he does come down once in a while, everybody clears out of his way. The mere sight of him, with his bushy grey eyebrows and immense beard, is alarming enough. All kinds of things are said about him. You, debtor, however, must certainly have learnt a good deal concerning him from your sister. Yes, but I am not going to repeat what I heard. Suppose it should come to his ears. I should get into no end of trouble about it. Barbel put her arm through Detta's in a confidential sort of way and said, Now do, just tell me what is wrong with the old man. Was he always shunned as he is now? And was he always so cross? I assure you I will hold my tongue if you will tell me. Very well then, I will tell you, but just wait a moment, said Detta, looking around for Heidi, who had slipped away unnoticed. I see where she is, explained Barbel. Look over there, and she pointed to a spot far away from the footpath. She is climbing up the slope yonder with Peter and his goats. But tell me about the old man. Did he ever have anything more than his two goats in his hut? I should think so indeed, said Detta, with animation. He was at one time the owner of one of the largest farms in Domlishlig. Domleshig. Domleshig. Um, I'm not German at all, or Swiss, or Italian, so some of the pronunciation is a little bit different to what I'm used to. So you can look it up for you, for yourself if you want. You can even give me a, a quasi 
phonetic spelling so I can get it right if you want. D-O-M-L-E-S-C-H-G. There you go. And we'll carry on. He was one, at one time the owner of one of the largest farms in Domleshig, where my mother used to live. But he drank and gambled away the whole of his property. And when his, this became known to his, to his mother and father, they died of sorrow, one shortly after the other. Uncle, having nothing left to him but his bad name, disappeared, and it was heard that he had gone to Naples as a soldier. After 12 or 15 years, he reappeared in Domelschig, bringing with him a young son whom he tried to place with some of his kinspeople. Every door, however, was shut to him. It was shut in his face, for no one wished to have any more to do with him. Embittered by his treatment, he vowed never to set foot in Domelschig again. And then, and he then came to Dorfli, where he lived with his little boy. His wife, it seemed, had died shortly after the child's birth. He must have accumulated some money during his absence, for he apprenticed his son Tobias to a carpenter. He was a steady lad and kindly received by everyone in Dorfli. His father, however, was still looked upon with suspicion, and it was even rumoured that he had killed a man in some brawl in Naples. Right, I'm just trying to deal with something on my phone that's not doing what I expected it to do. Um, that he'd even killed a man in Naples. Finding the right line. But why does everyone call him uncle? Surely he can't be uncle to everyone living in Dorfley, asked Barbel. Our grandmothers were related, so we used to call him uncle. And as my father had family connections with so many people in Dorfley, soon everyone fell in the habit of calling him uncle explained Detta. And what happened to Tobias? further questioned Babel, who was listening with deeper in, in, deep interest. Tobias was taught his trade in mills, and when he had served his apprenticeship, he came back to Dorfley and married my sister Adelaide. But their happiness did not last long. So this is how she's connected to him, obviously, because it's her sister's father-in-law. But happiness did not last long. Two years after their marriage, Tobias was killed in an accident. His wife was so overcome with grief that she fell into a fever from which she never recovered. She had always been rather delicate and subject to curious attacks, during which no one knew whether she was awake or sleeping. That's a bit odd. I wonder what that would have been now, what we would call it. And so two months after Tobias had been carried to the grave, his wife followed him. Their sad fate was the talk of everybody far and near, and the general opinion was expressed that it was a punishment which Uncle deserved for the godless life he had led. Our minister endeavoured to awaken his conscience, but the old man grew only more wrathful and stubborn and would not speak to a soul. All at once we heard that he had gone to live up on the Elm Mountain, and he did not intend to come down again. Since then, he has led his solitary life up there, and everyone knows him now by the name of Alm Uncle. Mother and I took Adelaide's, Adelaide's little one, then only a year old, into our care. When Mother died last year, and I went down to the baths to earn some money, I paid old Ursel to take care of her. So you see, I have done my duty. Now it's Uncle's turn. But where are you going to yourself, Barbel? We are now halfway up the Alm. We have just reached the place I wanted, answered Babel. I must see Peter's mother, who is doing some spinning for me. So goodbye, Detta, and good luck to you. She went toward a small, dark brown hut, which stood a few steps away from the path in a hollow that afforded it some protection from the mountain wind. Here lived Peter, the 11-year-old boy with his mother, Brigitte, and his blind grandmother, who was known to all the old and young in the neighbourhood as just grandmother. Every morning Peter went down to Dorfley to pick up a flock of goats to browse on the mountain. At sundown he went skipping down the mountain again with his light-footed animals. When he reached Dorfley he would give a shrill whistle, whereupon all the owners of the goats would come out to take home the animals that belonged to them. So it was saving them a lot of time and effort and they could go and do something else during the day instead of looking after their goats. There you go. Detta had been standing for a good ten minutes looking about her in every direction for some sign of the child and the goats. 
Meanwhile, Heidi and the goat herd were climbing up by a far and roundabout way, for Peter knew many spots where all kinds of good food in the shape of shrubs and plants grew for his goats. The child, exhausted with the heat and weight of her thick clothes, panted and struggled after him, at first with some difficulty. She said nothing, but her little eyes kept watching first Peter as he sprang nimbly hither and thither on his bare feet, clad only in his short, light breeches, and then the slim-legged goats that went leaping over rock, rocks and shrubs. All at once she sat down on the ground and began pulling off her shoes and stockings. Then she unwound the hot red shawl and took off her frock. But there was still another to unfasten, for Detta had put the Sunday dress on over the everyday one to save the trouble of carrying it. Quick as lightning, the everyday frock followed the other, and now the children stood up, clad only in her light, short-sleeved undergarment. She stretched out her little bare arms with glee, leaving all her clothes together in a tidy little heap. She went jumping and climbing up after Peter, and the goats after Peter and the goats as nimbly as any of the party. Now that Heidi was able to move at her ease, she began to enter into conversation with Peter. She asked him how many goats he had where he was going to with them, and what he had to do when he arrived there. At last, after some time, they came within view of Detta. Hardly had the latter caught sight of the, sight of the little company climbing up toward her when she shrieked out, Heidi, what have you been doing? What a sight you have made of yourself! And where are your two frocks and the red wrapper? And the new shoes I bought? And the new stockings I knitted for you? Everything gone, not a thing left! What can you have been thinking of, Heidi? Where are all your clothes? The child quietly pointed to a spot below on the mountainside and answered, down there. You good-for-nothing little thing, exclaimed Detta angrily. What could have put it into your head to do that? What made you undress yourself? By What do you mean by it? I don't want any clothes, said Heidi. You wretched, thoughtless child, have you no sense in you at all? Continued Detta, scolding and lamenting. Peter, you go down and fetch them for me as quickly as you can, and you shall have something nice. And she held out a bright new piece of money for him, to him that sparkled in the sun. Obviously, Peter as goat herd doesn't earn a lot of actual cash. Peter was immediately off down the steep mountainside, taking the shortest cut and was back again so quickly with the clothes that even Detta was obliged to give him a word of praise as she handed him the promised money. Peter promptly thrust it in his pocket and his face beamed with delight, for it was not often that he was the happy possessor of such riches. And that's the other thing with my interruptions. I don't always need to make them. Sorry. You can carry the things up for me as far as uncles as you, as we, you are going the same way, went on Detta who was prepared to continue her climb up the mountainside, which rose in a steep ascent immediately behind the goat herd's hut. So obviously this is the edge of where it's comfortable to climb, and then after this it gets a little bit more uncomfortable. <laughs> Peter willingly undertook to do this and followed after her. After a climb of more than three quarters of an hour, they reached the top of the Elm Mountain. Uncle's hut stood on a projection of the rock, exposed indeed to the winds, but where every day, where every ray of sun could rest upon it, and a full view could be had of the valley beneath. Behind the hut stood three old fir trees, with long, thick, unlopped branches. The trees hadn't been pruned. Beyond these rose a further wall of mountain, the lower heights of still overgrown with beautiful grass and plants. Against the hut on the side looking towards the valley, Uncle had put up a seat. Here he was sitting, his pipe in his mouth, and his hands on his knees, quietly looking out. When the children, the goats, and Detta suddenly clambered into view, Heidi was at the top first. She went straight up to the old man, put out her hand, and said, Good evening, Grandfather. So, so, what is the meaning of this? He asked gruffly as he gave the child an abrupt shake of the hand and gazed at her from under his bushy eyebrows. Heidi stared back steadily at him in return with unflinching gaze. Meanwhile, Detta had come up with Peter after her. 
I wish you good day, uncle, said Detta as she walked towards him, and I have brought you Tobias and Adelaide's child. You will hardly recognise her, as you have never seen, never seen her since she was a year old. And what has the child to do with me up here? asked the old man curtly. You there, he said. He then called out to Peter, be off with your goats. You are none too early as it is, and take mine with you. Peter obeyed on the instant and quickly disappeared. The child is here to remain with you, Detta made answer. I have done my duty by her for these four years, and now it is time for you to do yours. So obviously she is five. Five. That's it, is it? said the old man as he looked at her with a flash in his eye. And when the child begins to fret and whine after you, what am I to do with her then? That's your affair, retorted Detta, if you cannot arrange to keep her. Do with her as you like. You will be answerable for the result if harm happens to her, though you have hardly any need to add to the burden already on your conscience. Now Detta was not quite as easy in her own conscience about what she was doing and consequently was feeling hot and irritable and said more than she had intended. As she uttered her last words, Uncle rose from his seat. He looked at her in a way that made her draw back a step or two. Then flinging out his arm, he said to her in a commanding voice, Be off with you this instant and get back as quickly as you can to the place whence you came. And do not let me see your face again in a hurry. Detta did not wait to be told twice. Goodbye to you then. And to you, Heidi. She called as she turned quickly away and started to descend the mountain at a running pace, which she did not slacken till she found herself safely again at Dorfley. So she definitely believed the rumours that he'd killed somebody if she's running off scared when he's a little bit cross with her. And that's the end of that chapter, so we have a drink of water. Do you have your water handy? Go on, go and get it if you haven't, and maybe stop off the loo on the way. If you forgot to before. And get a snack as well. Where's your snack? Mmm. Wow. I was going to see if I could have it set up so you could see pictures. Hmm. I wonder if I still can. Let's see. You'll hear a little bit of noise here because my computer is not the quietest. So you'll hear me clicking and maybe tapping. I have a rather noisy keyboard. Now, let's find a picture. Let's see what we can find. need to turn it so I can see what the pictures are first, so I can choose the right one. They're not quite as bright as I would have liked. I need to edit them for you. So I'm going to move that. Where am I going to move it to? Just, it's only going to be there for now, and I'll show it to you a bit later. So there's Heidi <laughs> taking off all the extra clothes. I'm going to bring it down here for those who are watching on YouTube. There's Heidi taking off all her extra clothes because she's just too hot. And it's really hard going if you're climbing up a steep hillside like, um, like you see, ah, wrong side, like you see there that Peter is climbing up. That's hard work climbing up the mountainside like that when you're dressed in two dresses, hot shoes that you're not used to, hot stockings which are hand-knitted socks but they're longer than that, and a big shawl that's wrapped around you and tucked in. So I'm now going to find that and put that out of sight. There you go. Ooh, we might be able to... Um, Change that for another picture a bit later on. I should actually get the folder out that it's in. 
so I can find it for you. Find the pictures. And access them. I'm still doing stuff on the computer, as you can tell. That's why I'm not looking at you at the moment, sorry. <laughs> and I can't remember who the actual illustrator is for these ones, sorry. But that's just the way it is sometimes. Can make it so I can access them easily. I'm just seeing if I can make this a little bit more easily seen because some of the pictures are a little dark I've got some work ahead of me haven't I Nearly there. Won't be long now. At least I don't think it'll be long now. We'll see. Ah, found it. Trying to find the folder where it's meant to go. <laughs> what a ridiculous thing. Um, that one. And then that one. And then that one. And then oh, folders. Subfold, subfolders. That one. And then that one. And then one. Oh my goodness, that's a long way to find it. And yes, I do want to replace the old one. And I shall get that out of the way. And then we shall carry on reading. There you go. Are you back now? Did you get yourself something to eat and something to drink? And you're meant to have somewhere comfortable to sit too or lie down. Just because, you know, it's nicer when you're, when you're listening to a story. Oh, and the little mini tiara there is because it's Friday in New Zealand at the moment when I'm reading and because this part of New Zealand is in lockdown instead of having casual Friday we're having formal Friday just as a way to perk it up a little bit because if we're all at home working everyone's in fairly casuals anyway so we might as well have a change from casual to formal and thank Hilary Barry for that she's been great very encouraging but a lot of laughs as well here we go Heidi by Johanna Spiri, Chapter 2, A New Home with Grandfather. As soon as Detta had disappeared, the old man went back to his bench, and there he remained seated, staring at the ground without uttering a sound while thick curls of smoke floated upward from his pipe. Heidi, meanwhile, was enjoying herself in her new surroundings. She looked about till she found a shed, built against the hut, where the goats were kept. She peeped in and saw it was empty. She continued her search, but presently came back to where her grandfather was sitting. Seeing that he was in exactly the same position as when she left him, she went and placed herself in front of the old man and said, I want to see what you have inside the house. Come then, and the grandfather rose and went before her toward the hut. So he's obviously okay with her being as direct as that, unlike some people. Bring your bundle of clothes in with you, he bid her as she was following. I shan't want them any more, was her prompt answer. The old man turned and looked searchingly at the child, whose dark eyes were sparkling in delighted anticipation of what she was going to see inside. She is certainly not wanting an intelligence, he murmured to himself. 
And why shall you not want them any more? he asked aloud. Because I want to go about like the goats, with their thin light legs. Well, you can do so if you like, said her grandfather, but bring the things in. We must put them in the cupboard. That's fair enough. Heidi did as she was told. The old man now opened the door, and Heidi stepped inside after him. She found herself in a good-sized room, which covered the whole ground floor of the hut. The table and chair were the only furniture. In one corner stood the grandfather's bed, in another was the hearth, with a large kettle hanging above it, and on the further side was a large door in the wall. This was the cupboard. The grandfather opened it. Inside were his clothes. On a second shelf were some plates and cups and glasses, and on a higher one still, a round loaf, smoked meat, and cheese, for everything that Alm Uncle needed for his food and clothing was kept in this cupboard. Heidi thrust in her bundle of clothes as far back behind her grandfather's things as possible, so they might not easily be found again. She then looked carefully round the room and asked, Where am I to sleep, grandfather? Wherever you like, he answered. Heidi was delighted and began at once to examine all the nooks and corners to find out where it would be pleasantest to sleep. In the corner, near her grandfather's bed, she saw a short ladder against the wall. Up she climbed and found herself in the hayloft. There lay a large heap of fresh, fresh sweet-smelling hay, while through a round window in the wall she could see right down the valley. I shall sleep up here, Grandfather, she called down to him. It's lovely up here. Come up and see how lovely it is. Oh, I know all about it, he called up an answer. I'm getting the bed ready now, she called down again as she went busily to and fro at her work. But I shall want you to bring me up a sheet. You can't have a bed without a sheet. You, you, want, it, you want it to lie upon. All right, said the grandfather, and presently he went to the cupboard, and after rummaging about inside for a few minutes, he drew out a long, coarse piece of stuff, which was all he had to do duty for a sheet. He carried it up to the loft, where he found Heidi had already made quite a nice bed, and here... I'm going to interrupt, interrupt myself to see if I can give you the next picture. At least I have the folder handy now. Just have to get it in the light view, right view. And there they are. You can see the round window just beyond Grandfather then. There, looking out into the valley and there's Heidi rearranging the bits of hay in the in the loft. I'll carry on reading now. He carried it up to the loft where he found Heidi had already made quite a nice bed. She had put an extra heap of hay at one end for a pillow and had so arranged it that when in bed she would be able to see comfortably out through the round window. That is capital said her grandfather. Now we must put on the sheet. They spread it over the bed, and where it was too long or too, too broad, Heidi quickly tucked it in under the hay. It looked as tidy and comfortable a bed as you could wish for, and Heidi stood gazing thoughtfully at her handiwork. We have forgotten something now, grandfather, she said after a short silence. What is it? he asked. A coverlid. When you get into bed, you have to creep in between the sheet and the coverlid. Oh, that's the way, is it? But I, su I, but suppose I have not got a coverlid, said the old man. Well, never mind, Grandfather, said Heidi in a consoling tone of voice. I can take some more hay to put over me. And she was turning quickly to fetch another armful from the heap when her grandfather stopped her. Wait a moment, he said, and he climbed down the ladder again and went towards his bed. He returned to the loft with a large, thick sack made of flax which he laid tidily over the bed. Now flax, in this context, is not New Zealand flax. Just in case you're wondering, if you're a Kiwi listening to this, it's what we now call linen. The plant that it's made from is called flax. Our flax in New Zealand is named after it because it has long fibres that can be cleaned and then spun and woven. And I'm guessing that because they describe it as being made out of flax, that it's actually not a fine linen, but it's coarse 
a lot less processed to be able to make the, the fabric that it's made out of. A large thick sack made of flax, which he laid tidily over the bed. That is a splendid coverlid, said Heidi, and the bed looks lovely altogether. I wish it was night so that I might get inside it at once. I think we'd better go down and have something to eat first, said the grandfather. While the kettle was boiling, the old man held a large piece of cheese on a long iron fork over the fire, turning it round and round till it was toasted a nice golden yellow colour on each side. Heidi watched all that was going on with eager curiosity. Suddenly, some new idea seemed to come into her head, for she turned and ran to the cupboard and, began, and then began going busily backwards and forwards. Presently, the grandfather got up and came to the table with a jug and the cheese, and there he saw it already, it saw it already tidily laid, with the round loaf and two plates and two knives, each in its right place. That Ah, that's right, said the grandfather. I'm glad to see that you have some ideas of your own. And as he spoke, he laid the toasted cheese on a layer of bread. But there is still something missing. Heidi looked at the jug that was steaming away invitingly and ran quickly back to the cupboard. At first she could only see a small bowl left on the shelf. But she was not long in perplexity, for a moment later she caught sight of two glasses further back, and without an instant's loss of time, she returned with these and the bowl and put them down on the table. Good, I see you know how to set about things, but what will you do for a seat? The grandfather himself was sitting on the only chair in the room. Heidi flew to the hearth and dragged the three-legged stool up to the table and sat herself down upon it. The grandfather filled his bowl with milk and pushed it and filled the, the bowl with milk and pushed it in front of Heidi. Then he brought her a large slice of bread and a piece of the golden cheese and told her to eat. Heidi lifted the bowl with both hands and drank without pause till it was empty, for the thirst of all her long hot journey had returned upon her. Then she drew a deep breath in the eagerness of her thirst she had not stopped to breathe and put down the bowl. Was the milk nice? he asked. I never drank any so good before, answered Heidi. Then you must have some more. And the old man filled her bowl again to the brim, and set it before the child, who was now hungrily beginning her bread, having first spread it with the cheese, which, after being toasted, was soft as butter. The meal being over, the grandfather went outside to put the goat shed in order, and Heidi watched with interest as he, while he first swept it out. I'm thinking that he probably ate something too while she was eating. First swept it out and then put fresh straw for the goats to sleep on. Then he went to the little well shed and there he cut some long round sticks and a small round board. In this he bored some holes and stuck the sticks into them and there, as if by magic, was a three-legged stool, just like her grandfather's only higher. Heidi stood and looked at it, speechless with astonishment. What do you think that is? asked her grandfather. It's my stool, I know, because it's such a high one and it was made all of a minute, said the child, still lost in wonder and admiration. She understands what she sees, her eyes are in the right place, remarked her grandfather to himself. Excuse me a minute, I'm going to sneeze. Mm. Sorry, itchy nose all of a sudden. No, I haven't been talking to the cat. Well, not this afternoon anyway. She understands what she sees. Her eyes are in the right place, remarked the grandfather to himself. And so the time passed happily on till evening. Then the wind began to, wind began to roar louder than ever through the old fir trees. Heidi listened with delight to the sound, and it filled her heart so full of gladness that she skipped and danced round the old trees as if some unheard of joy had come to her. The grandfather stood and watched her from the shed. Suddenly a shrill whistle was heard. Down from the heights above, the goats came springing one after another with Peter in their midst. I'm just going to have a quick look and see if that's what the next picture is going to be no it's not so you don't get that one just yet the goats came springing down one after another um, 
Suddenly a shrill whistle was heard. Down from the heights above, the goats came springing, one after another, with Peter in their midst. Heidi sprang forward with a cry of joy and rushed among the flock, greeting first one and then another of her old friends of the morning. As they neared the hut, the goats stood still, and then two of their number, two beautiful slender animals, one white and one brown, ran forward to where the grandfather was standing and began licking his hands, for he was holding a little salt, which he always had ready for his goats on their return home. Um, there's a lot of minerals in the sort of salt that they used to give them, which make up for some things that may be missing in the soil. And it's not uncommon to use salt as a mineral supplement for grazing animals. He began, they began licking his hands, for he was holding a little salt, which he always had ready for his goats on their return home. Peter went on down the mountain with the remainder of his flock. Heidi tenderly stroked the two goats in turn, jumping about in her glee at the pretty little animals. And I'm going to show you a picture that's in this version of the book, which is different to the series of illustrations that I have been showing you. This one, Heidi tenderly stroked the two goats in turn. And no, this version of the book is not going to enlarge them. And it's a little hard to see, but there you go. There she is saying hello to the goats. Heidi, Heidi tenderly stroked the two goats in turn, jumping about in her glee at the pretty little animals. Are they ours, Grandfather? Are they both ours? Are you going to put them in the shed? Will they always stay with us? Heidi's questions came tumbling out, one after the other, so that her Grandfather had only time to answer each of them with yes, yes. When the goats had finished licking up the salt, her Grandfather told her to go and fetch her bowl and br the bread. Heidi obeyed and was soon back again. The grandfather milked the white goat and filled her basin, and then breaking off a piece of bread. Now eat your supper, he said, and then go up to bed. Detta left another little bundle for you with a nightgown and other small things in it, which you will find at the bottom of the cupboard if you want them. I must go and shut up the goats, so be off and sleep well. Good night, grandfather, good night. What are their names, Grandfather? What are their names? She called out as she ran after his retreating figure and the goats. The white one is named Little Swan, and the brown one, Little Bear, he answered. Good night, Little Swan. Good night, Little Bear, she called again at the top of her voice. Then she ate her supper and went indoors and climbed up to her bed, where she was soon lying as sweetly and soundly asleep as any young princess on her couch of silk. And that's the end of chapter two. So time for a drink and a snack. And if you need it, a quick trip to the loo. Yeah. Mm, I remember hearing this story when I was growing up. And I remember reading it. And I remember seeing it. I don't know if it was a TV series or if it was a movie and if it was the Shirley Temple version of the movie or if it was another one. That's interesting. I'd have to have a look and see if any of it looks particularly familiar. I'm pretty sure that the Shirley Temple one you can find on YouTube. You can try that. Anyway, <clears throat> carrying on with the story. I'm reading Heidi by Johanna Spiri. And I'm reading chapter 3, Little Bear and Little Swan. Heidi felt very happy next morning as she woke up in her new home and remembered all the things that she had seen the day before and which she would see again that day. And above all, she thought with delight of the dear goats. She jumped quickly out of bed and a very few minutes sufficed her to put on the clothes that she had taken off the night before, for there were not many of them. Then she climbed down the ladder and ran outside the hut. There stood Peter, all ready with his flock of goats, and the grandfather was just bringing his two out of the shed to join the others. Sorry, to join the others. Heidi ran forward to wish good morning to him and the goats. Do you want to go with them onto the mountain? asked her grandfather. Nothing could have pleased Heidi better, and she jumped for joy in answer. 
The grandfather went inside the hut, calling to Peter to follow him and bring in his wallet. A wallet is, in this use, is a type of bag, which the picture, the story will probably describe for us. Um, bring in his wallet. Peter obeyed with astonishment, because he only knows him as a grumpy old man who has a couple of goats that, that Peter looks after. And laid, uh, Peter followed, obey, uh, obeyed with astonishment and laid down the little bag which held his meagre dinner. Open it, said the old man, and he put in a large piece of bread and an equally large piece of cheese, which made Peter open his eyes, for each was twice the size of the two portions which he had had for, which he had for his own dinner. Heidi's a little girl, half his age, and Grandfather is giving her twice as much food as he's got. There. Now there is only the little bowl to add, continued the grandfather, for the child cannot drink her milk as you do from the goat. She is not accustomed to that. You must milk two bowlfuls for her when she has her dinner, for she is going with you and will remain with you till you return this evening. But take care she does not fall over any of the rocks. Do you hear? They stared joyfully, started, no, stared. They started joyfully for the mountain, Heidi went running hither and thither and shouting with delight, for here were whole patches of delicate red primroses, and there the blue gleam of the lovely gentian. Primroses we're used to as being a pale yellow colour, but they also come in other colours too. Not, not the ones that you get from a garden centre, but ones that grow in the wild do come in other colours. Love, and the blue gleam of the lovely gentian, while above them all laughed and nodded the tender-leaved, Golden Cistus. I don't know what that one is, but you can look it up. C I S T U S. So there's all these different flowers on the hillside. Enchanted with all this waving field of brightly coloured flowers, Heidi forgot even Peter and the goats. She ran on in front and then off to the side, tempted first one way and then the other, as she caught sight of some bright spot of glowing red or yellow. And all the while she was plucking whole handfuls of the flowers, which she put into her little apron, for she wanted to take them all home and stick them in the hay so that she might make her bedroom look just like the meadow outside. Peter had therefore to be on the alert, and his round eyes, which did not move very quickly, had more work than they could well manage, for the goats were as lively as Heidi. They ran in all directions. And Peter had to follow, whistling and calling and swinging his stick, to get all the runways, runaways together again. Finally, they arrived at the spot where Peter generally halted for his goats to pasture, and there he took up his quarters for the day. It lay at the foot of the high rocks, which were covered for some distance up by bushes and fir trees, beyond which rose their bare and rugged summits. On one side of the mountain, the rock was split into deep clefts, and the grandfather had reason to warn Peter of danger. Having climbed as far as the halting place, Peter unslung his wallet and put it carefully in a little hollow of the ground, for he knew what the wind was like up there, and did not want to see his precious belongings sent rolling down the mountain by a sudden gust. Then he threw himself at full length on the warm ground, and soon fell asleep. Heidi, meanwhile, had unfastened her apron and rolled it carefully round the flowers, laid it beside Peter's wallet inside the hollow. Then she sat down beside his outstretched figure and looked about her. The goats were climbing about among the bushes overhead. She had never felt so happy in her life before. She drank in the golden sunlight, the fresh air, the sweet smell of the flowers, and wished for nothing better than to remain there forever. Suddenly she heard a loud, harsh cry overhead, and lifting her eyes she saw a bird larger than any she had ever seen before with great spreading wings wheeling round in wide circles and uttering a piercing croaking kind of sound above her peter peter wake up called out heidi see the great bird is there look look peter got up on hearing her call and together they sat and watched the bird which rose higher and higher in the blue air till it disappeared behind the grey mountain tops where is it gone to? asked Heidi, who had followed the bird's movements with intense interest. Home to its nest, said Peter. Is his home right up there? Oh, how nice to be up so high. Why does he make that noise? Because he can't help it, 
said Peter. Let's climb up there and see where his nest is, proposed Heidi. Oh, 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 exclaimed Peter, his disapproval of Heidi's suggestion becoming more marked with each statement. Why, even the goats cannot climb as high as that. Besides, didn't Uncle say that you were not to fall over the rocks? Peter now began suddenly whistling and calling in such a loud manner that Heidi could not think what was happening, but the goats evidently understood. His voice, for one after another, they came springing down the rocks until they were all assembled on the green plateau. That's the flat area. Heidi jumped up and ran in and out among them, for it was new to her to see the goats playing together like this. Meanwhile, Peter had taken the wallet out of the hollow and placed the pieces of bread and cheese on the ground in the shape of a square, the larger two on Heidi's side and the smaller two on his own, for he knew exactly which were hers and which were his. Then he took the little bowl and milked some fresh, a delicious fresh milk into it from the white goat and afterwards set the bowl in the middle of the square. Leave off jumping about, it's time for dinner, said Peter. Sit down now and begin. Heidi sat down. Is the milk for me, she asked. I'm just going to find you the picture, okay? Here we go. And that one. And I shall now make it so you can see it. There they are. And there's Heidi and Peter sitting on the ground, and there's the goats, and there's the dis other dis more distant mountains, and there's the line of trees. You can see it's quite steep behind them, isn't it? But they're sitting in the grass. I just wish I had one that was actually a little bit clearer than that. Anyway, doesn't matter. Let's move this one out of the way for now. So I can see what's going on. <laughs> right. Yes, Peter replied, and the two large pieces of bread and cheese are yours also. And when you have drunk up that milk, you are to have another bowl full from the white goat, and then it will be my turn. And which do you get your milk from? inquired Heidi. From my own goat, the piebald one. But go on now with your dinner, said Peter again, reminding her it was time to eat. Heidi took up the bowl and drank her milk. And as soon as she had put it down empty, Peter rose and filled it again for her. Then she broke off a piece of her bread and held out the remainder, which was still larger than Peter's own piece, together with the whole big slice of cheese, to her companion, saying, You can have it. I have plenty. Peter looked at Heidi, unable to speak for astonishment. He hesitated for a moment, for he could not believe that Heidi was in earnest. But the latter kept on holding out the bread and cheese, and as Peter did not take it, she laid it down on his knees. He saw then that she really meant it. He seized the food, nodded his thanks and acceptance of her present, then made a more splendid meal than he had known ever since he was a goat herd. Heidi the while still continued to watch the goats. Tell me all their names, she said. Peter knew these by heart, so he began telling Heidi the name of each goat in turn as he pointed it out to her. She listened with great attention, and it was not long before she could herself distinguish the goats one from another, and could call each by name, for every goat had its own peculiarities, which could not easily be mistaken, once you knew them. There was the great Turk with his, great, with his big horns, who was always wanting to butt the others, so that most of them ran away when they saw him coming, and would have nothing to do with their rough companion. Only Greenfinch, the slender, nimble little goat, was brave enough to face him and would make a rush at him three or four times in succession. Then there was little white Snowflake who bleated in such a plaintive and beseeching manner that Heidi already had several times run to it and taken its head in her hands to comfort it. Just at this moment the pleading young cry was heard again and Heidi jumped up running and putting her arms round the little creature's neck asked in a sympathetic voice, what is it, little snowflake? Why do you call like that as if in trouble? The goat pressed closer to Heidi in a confiding way and left off bleating. Uh, Peter called out from where he was sitting, for he had not yet got to the end of his bread and cheese. She cries like that because the old goat is not with her, 
She was sold at Mayenfeld the day before yesterday, and so will not come up the mountain any more. Who is the old goat? called Heidi back. Why, her mother, of course, was the answer. Where is the grandmother? called Heidi again. She has none. And the grandfather? She has none. Oh, you poor little snowflake, exclaimed Heidi, clasping the animal gently to her. But do not cry like that any more, see now? I shall come up here with you every day so that you will not be alone any more. And if you want anything, you have only to come to me. The goats were now beginning to climb the rocks again, each seeking for the plants it liked in its own fashion, some jumping over everything they met till they found what they wanted, others going more carefully and cropping all the nice leaves by the way. The Turk still now and then giving the others a poke with his horns. Little swan and little bear clambered lightly up and never failed to find the best bushes, and then they would stand gracefully poised on their pretty legs, delicately nibbling at the leaves. Heidi stood with her hands behind her back, carefully noting all they did. Peter, she said to the boy who had again thrown himself down on the ground, the prettiest of all the goats are little swan and little bear. Yes, I know they are, was the answer. Alm uncle brushes them down and washes them and gives them salt, and he has the nicest shed for them. So obviously Alm uncle looks after his goats better than the others do in the village, further down in the village. All of a sudden, Peter leapt to his feet and ran hastily after the goats. Heidi followed him as fast as she could, for she was too eager to know what had happened to stay behind. Peter dashed through the middle of the flock towards the side of the mountain, where the rocks fell perpendicularly to the, a great depth below, and where any thoughtless goat, if it went too near, might fall. Might fall over and break all its legs. He had caught sight of the inquisitive green finch taking leaps in the, that direction, and he was only just in time, for the animal had already sprung to the edge of the abyss. All Peter could do was throw himself down and seize one of her hind legs. Greenfinch, thus taken by surprise, began beating furiously, angry at being held so fast and prevented from continuing her voyage of discovery. She struggled to get loose and endeavoured so obstinately to leap forward that Peter shouted to Heidi to come and help him, for he could could not get up and was afraid of pulling out the goat's leg altogether, um, dis dislocating it. Heidi had already run up and she saw at once the danger both Peter and the animal were in. She quickly gathered a bunch of sweet-smelling leaves and then holding them under Greenfinch's nose said coaxingly, Come, come, Greenfinch, you must not be naughty. Look, you might fall down there and break your leg and that would give you a dreadful pain. The young animal turned quickly and began contentedly eating the leaves out of Heidi's hand. Meanwhile, Peter got onto his feet again and took hold of Greenfinch by the band round her neck from which her bell was hung, and Heidi taking hold of her in the same way on the other side, they led the wanderer back to the, refleet, to black, back to the rest of the flock that had remained peacefully feeding. Peter, now he had his goat in safety, lifted his stick in order to give her a good beating as punishment, and Greenfinch, seeing what was coming, shrank back in fear. But Heidi cried out, No, no, Peter, you must not strike her. See how frightened she is. She deserves it, said Peter, and again lifted his stick. Then Heidi flung herself against him and cried indignantly, You have no right to touch her. It will hurt her. Let her alone. Peter looked with surprise at the commanding little figure, whose dark eyes were flashing, and reluctantly he let his stick drop. Well, I will let her off if you will give me some more of your cheese tomorrow, he said, for he was determined to have something to make up to him for his fright. You shall have it all tomorrow and every day. I do not want it, replied Heidi, giving ready consent to his demand, and I will give you bread as well, a large piece like you had today, but then you must promise never to beat Greenfinch or Snowflake or any of the goats. All right, said Peter, I don't care which meant that he would agree to the bargain, and let go of Greenfinch, who joyfully sprang to join her companions. And thus, imperceptibly, the day had crept on to its close, and now the sun was on the point of sinking out of sight, behind the high mountains. Heidi was again sitting on the ground, when all at once she sprang to her feet. Peter! Peter! Everything's on fire! 
All the rocks are burning and the great snow mountain in the sky. Oh, look, look, the high rock up there is red with flame. Oh, the beautiful fiery snow. Stand up, Peter. See, the rock has reached the great bird's nest. Look at the rocks. Look at the fir trees. Everything, everything's on fire. It is always like that, said Peter composedly, continuing to peel his stick. But it is not really fire. What is it then? said Heidi. It gets like that of itself, explained Peter. Look, look, said Heidi in fresh excitement. Now they have turned all rose colour. Look at that one covered in snow and that with the high red pointed rock, the high pointed rocks. What do you call them? Mountains have not any names, he answered. Oh, how beautiful. Look at the crimson snow. And up there on the rocks, there are ever so many roses. Oh, now they're turning grey. Oh, oh, now all the colour has died away. It's all gone, Peter. And Heidi sat down on the ground, looking as full of distress as if everything had really come to an end. It will come again tomorrow, said Peter. Get up, we must go home now. He whistled to his goats, and together they all started on their homeward way. Is it like that every day? Shall we see it every day when we bring the goats up here? asked Heidi, as she clambered down the mountain at Peter's side. She waited eagerly for his answer, hoping that he would tell her it was so. It is like that most days, he replied. But will it be like that tomorrow for certain? Heidi persisted. Yes, yes, tomorrow for certain, Peter assured her in answer. Heidi now felt quite happy again, and her little brain was so full of new impressions and new thoughts that she did not speak until uh, any more until they had reached the hut. The grandfather was sitting under the fir trees where he had put up a new seat. Heidi ran up to him, followed by the white and brown goats, for they knew their own master and stall. Peter called out after her, Come with me again tomorrow. Good night, for he was anxious for more than one reason that Heidi should go with him the next day. Oh, grandfather, cried Heidi, it was so beautiful, the fire and the roses on the rocks and the blue and yellow flowers, and look what I have brought you. And opening the apron that held her flowers, she shook them all out at her grandfather's feet. But the poor flowers, how changed they were. Heidi hardly knew them again. They looked like dried bits of hay. Not a single little flower cup stood open. Oh, Grandfather, what is the matter with them? exclaimed Heidi in shocked surprise. They were not like that this morning. Why do they look so now? They like to stand out in the sun and not to be shut up in an apron, said her Grandfather. Then I will never gather any more. But, Grandfather, why did the great bird go on croaking so? She continued in an eager tone of inquiry. Go along now and get into your bath while I go and get some milk. When we are together at supper, I will tell you all about it. Heidi obeyed, and when later she was sitting on her high stool before her milk bowl with her grandfather beside her, she repeated her question. Why does the great bird go on croaking and screaming down at us, Grandfather? He is, mocking all at, he is mocking at the people who live down below in the villages because they all go huddling and gossiping together and encourage one another in evil talking and deeds. He calls out, If you would separate and each go your own way and come up here and live on a height as I do, it would be better for you. I think this is the grandfather's own thoughts. There was almost a wildness in the old man's voice as he spoke, so that Heidi seemed to hear the croaking of the bird even more distinctly. Why haven't the mountains any names? Heidi went on. They have names, answered her grandfather, and if you can describe one of them to me that I know, I will tell you what it is called. Heidi then described to him the rocky mountain with the two high peaks, so exactly that the grandfather was delighted. Just so. I know it. And he told her its name. I think he's enjoying how observant she is. Then Heidi told him of the mountain with the great snowfield and how it had been on fire. The grandfather, remember, she's only five, and where she has lived before obviously wasn't among the mountains. And so, to her, this is all new and something she doesn't understand. The grandfather explained to her it was the sun that did it. When he says good night to the mountains, he throws his most beautiful colours over them so that they may not forget him before he comes again the next day. 
Heidi was delighted with this explanation and could hardly bear to wait for another day to come, that she might once more climb up the mountains and see how the sun bid good night to the mountains. But she had to go to bed first, and all night she slept soundly on her bed of hay, dreaming of nothing but of shining mountains with red roses all over them, among which happy little snowflake went leaping in and out. And that's the end of that chapter. We will have one more. I'm just having a quick look at the pictures to see what is coming next. Hmm. We'll see. See how we go. Chapter break. Have a drink. Quick. I'm getting hungry. I didn't have, bring any snacks with me. I'll have to get something after I finish reading. Mm, that was a bit noisy. Sorry. <clears throat> so have you remembered anything that you'd forgotten from previously in the story? I'd forgotten about the sunset because it's been a very long time since I've read this story. We'll carry on, shall we? Hi, I'm Jeff, and I'm reading Heidi by Johanna Spiri Spiri. That's more the way the Germans say it, apparently. And we're reading Chapter 4, Shooting Down the Mountainside. And here we go. The next morning, the sun came out, er, the sun came out early, as bright as ever. And then Peter appeared with the goats, and again the two children climbed up together to the high meadows, and so it went on day after day, till Heidi, passing her life thus among the grass and flowers, was burnt brown with the sun, and grew so strong and healthy that nothing ever ailed her. She was happy too, and lived from day to day as free and light-hearted as the little birds that make their home among the green forest trees. Then the autumn came, and the wind blew louder and stronger, and the grandfather would say sometimes, Today you must stay at home, Heidi. A sudden gust of wind would blow a little thing like you over the rocks into the valley below in a moment. Because she's not as big and heavy or as strong as Peter, remember. Whenever Peter heard that he must uh, heard that he must go alone, he looked very unhappy, for he saw nothing but mishaps of all kinds ahead, and did not know how he should bear the long, dull day without Heidi. Then, too, there was the good meal he would miss, and besides that, the goats on these days were so naughty and obstinate that he had twice the usual trouble with them, for they had grown so accustomed to Heidi's presence that they would run in every direction and refuse to go on unless she was with them. Heidi was never unhappy, for wherever she was, she found something to interest her or amuse her. She liked best, it is true, to go out with Peter up to the flowers and the great bird, but she also found her grandfather's hammering and sawing and carp carpentering very entertaining. And if it should chance to be the day when the large round goat's milk cheese was made, she enjoyed beyond measure watching her grandfather stir the great cauldron. The thing which attracted her most, however, was the waving and roaring of the three old fir trees on these windy days. She would stand underneath them and look up, unable to tear herself away, looking and listening while they bowed and swayed and roared as the mighty wind rushed through them. There was no longer now the warm, bright sun that had shone all through the summer. So Heidi went to the cupboard and got out her shoes and stockings and dress. Then it grew very cold, and Peter would come up early in the morning, blowing on his fingers to keep them warm, but he soon left off coming, for one night there was a heavy fall of snow, and the next morning the whole mountain was covered with it, and not a single little green leaf even was to be seen anywhere upon it. There was no Peter that day, and Heidi stood at the little window looking out in wonderment, for the snow was beginning again and the thick flakes kept falling, till the snow was up to the window. And still they continued to fall, and the snow grew higher, so that at last the window could not be opened, and she and her grandfather were shut up fast within the hut. Heidi thought this was great fun, and ran from one window to the other. The next day, the snow having ceased, 
The grandfather went out and shoveled it away from the house and threw it into such great heaps that they looked like mountains. Heidi and her grandfather were sitting one afternoon on their three-legged stools before the fire, when there was a great thump at the door. It was Peter, all white with snow, for he had to, for he had, had to fight his way through deep snowdrifts. He had been determined, however, to climb up to the hut, for it was a week now since he had seen Heidi. Good evening, he said as he came in. Then he went and placed himself as near the fire as he could, his whole face beaming with pleasure at finding himself there. Heidi looked on in astonishment, for Peter was beginning to thaw all over with the warmth, so that he had the appearance of a trickling waterfall. The snow that was stuck in his clothing was all melting and running off. Well, General, how goes it with you? said the grandfather. Now that you have lost your army, you will have to turn to your pen and pencil. Why must he turn to his pen and pencil? asked Heidi, immediately, full of curiosity. During the winter he must go to school, explained his grandfather, and learn how to read and write. It's a bit hard, although useful, sometimes afterwards. Am I not right, General? Yes, indeed, assented Peter. Heidi's interest was now thoroughly awakened, and she had so many questions to ask Peter about school, and the conversation took so long that he had time to get thoroughly dry. Well now, General, you've been under fire for some time and must want some refreshment. Come and join us, said the grandfather as he brought the supper out of the cupboard and Heidi pushed the stools to the table. There was also now a bench fastened against the wall, for as he was no longer alone, the grandfather had put up seats of various kinds here and there, long enough to hold two persons, for Heidi had a way of always keeping close to her grandfather when he was walking whether he was walking, sitting, or standing. Peter opened his eyes very wide when he saw a, what a large piece of meat Alm Uncle gave him on his thick slice of bread. I'm pretty sure that Peter's family is, is poorer than, than Heidi's grandfather. It was a long time since Peter had seen anything so nice to eat. As soon as the pleasant meal was over, he began to get ready for returning home, for it was already growing dark. He had said his good night and his thanks and was just going out when he turned and said, I shall come again next Sunday, this day week, this day week. And my grandmother sent word that she would like you to come and see her some day. It was quite a new idea to Heidi that she should go and pay anybody a visit and she could not get it out of her head. So the first thing she said to her grandfather the next day was, I must go down to see the grandmother today. She will be expecting me. Just remember, she's only five, maybe six. It depends on if she's had a birthday. The snow is too deep, answered the grandfather, trying to put her off. Not a day passed, but when she said five or six times to her grandfather, I must certainly go today. The grandmother will be waiting for me. On the fourth day, when Heidi was sitting on her high stool at dinner with the bright sun shining in through her, in upon her through the window, she began repeating her little speech. I must certainly go down to see the grandmother today or else I shall keep her waiting too long. The grandfather rose from the table, climbed up to the hayloft and brought down the thick sack that was Heidi's coverlid and said, come along then. The child skipped out gleefully after him into the glittering world of snow. The old fir trees were standing now quite silent, their branches covered with the white snow, and they looked so lovely as they glittered and sparkled in the sunlight that Heidi jumped for joy at the sight and kept on calling out, Come here, come here, grandfather. The fir trees are all silver and gold. The grandfather had gone into the shed, and he now came out, dragging a large hand sleigh. Inside there was a low seat, and the sleigh could be pushed forward and guided by the feet of the one who sat upon it, with the help of a pole that was fastened to the side. The old man got in and lifted the child onto his lap, then he wrapped her up in the sack that she might keep nice and warm, and put his left arm closely round her, for it was necessary to hold her tight during the coming journey. He now grasped the pole with his right hand, and gave the sleigh a push forward with his two feet. It shot down the mountainside with such rapidity that Heidi thought they were flying through the air like a bird and shouted aloud with delight. I'm just going to find you the picture.
There they are, sliding down the hillside. Suddenly they came to a standstill and they were at Peter's hut. Her grandfather lifted her out and unwrapped her. There you are, now go in and when it begins to grow dark you must start on your way home again. Then he left her and went up the mountain, pulling his sleigh after him. Heidi opened the door of the hut and stepped into a tiny room that looked very dark, with a fireplace and a few dishes on a wooden shelf. This was the little kitchen. She opened another door and found herself in another small room, for the place was not a herdsman's hut, like her grandfather's, with one large room on the ground floor and a hayloft above, but a very old cottage, where everything was narrow and poor and shabby. A table was close to the door, and as Heidi stepped in, she saw a woman sitting at it, putting a patch on a waistcoat, which Heidi recognised at once as Peter's. In the corner sat an old woman, bent with age, spinning. Heidi was quite sure this was the grandmother, so she went up to the spinning wheel and said, Good day, grandmother. I have come at last. Did you think I was a long time coming? The old woman raised her head and felt for the hand that the child held out to, held out to her, and when she had found it, she passed her own over it thoughtfully for a few seconds and then said, Are you the child who lives up with Elm, uncle? Are you Heidi? Yes, yes, answered Heidi. I have just come down in the sleigh with Grandfather. Is it possible? Why, your hands are quite warm. Brigitte, did Alm Uncle come himself with the child? Peter's mother had left her work and risen from the table and now stood looking at Heidi with curiosity, scanning her from head to foot. I do not know, Mother, whether Uncle came himself. It's hardly likely the child probably makes a mistake. But Heidi looked steadily at the woman and said, I know quite well who wrapped me up in my bed cover and brought me down in the sleigh. It was Grandfather. There was some truth then, perhaps, in what Peter used to tell us of Alm Uncle during the summer when we thought he must be wrong, said Grandmother. But who would ever have believed that such a thing was possible? I did not think the child would live three weeks up there. What is she like, Brigitte? The latter had so thoroughly examined Heidi on all sides that she was well able to describe her to her mother. Heidi, meanwhile, had not been idle. She had made the round of the room and looked carefully at everything there was to be seen. All of a sudden she exclaimed, Grandmother, one of your shutters is flapping backwards and forwards. Grandfather would put a nail in it and make it all right in a minute. It will break one of the panes some day. Look how it keeps on banging. One of the panes of glass will let the wind and the snow in. Ah, dear child, said the old woman, I am not able to see it, but I can hear that and many other things besides the shutter. Everything about the place rattles and creaks when the wind is blowing, and it gets inside through all the cracks and holes. The house is going to pieces, and in the night when the two others are asleep, I often lie awake in fear and trembling, thinking that the whole place will give way and fall and kill us. There is not a creature to mend anything for us, for P Peter does not understand such work. But why cannot you see, Grandmother, that the shutter is loose? Look, there it goes again. See that one there? And Heidi pointed to the particular shutter. Alas, child, I can see nothing. Nothing, said the Grandmother in a voice of lamentation. But if I were to go outside and put back the shutter so that you had more light, then you could see, Grandmother? No. No, not even then. No one can make it light for me again. But if you were to go outside among all the white snow, then surely you would find it light. Just come with me, Grandmother, and I will show you. Heidi took hold of the old woman's hand to lead her along, for she was beginning to feel quite distressed at the thought of her being without light. Let me be, dear child. It is always dark for me now, whether, it is sn whether in snow or sun. It will never be light for me again on earth. Never. At these words, Heidi broke into loud crying. In her distress, she kept on sobbing out, Who can make it light for you again? Can no one do it? Isn't there anyone who can do it? The grandmother now tried to comfort the child, but it was not easy to quiet her. Heidi did not often weep, but when she did, she could not get over her trouble for a long time. 
At last the old woman said, Dear Heidi, you cannot think how glad I am to hear a kind word when I can no longer see, and it is such a pleasure to me to listen to you while you talk. So, come and sit beside me and tell me what you do up there, and how Grandfather occupies himself. I knew him very well in the old days, but for many years now I have heard nothing of him except through Peter, who never says much. This was a new and happy idea to Heidi. She'd quickly dried her tears and said in a comforting voice, Wait, Grandmother, till I have told Grandfather everything. He will make it light for you again, I am sure, and will do something so that the house will not fall. He will put everything right for you. Heidi now began to give a lively description of her life with the Grandfather and of the days she spent on the mountain with the goats and then went on to tell what she did during the winter and how her grandfather was able to make all sorts of things, seats and stools and mangers where the hay was put for little swan and little bear, besides a large, a new large water tub for her to bathe in when the summer came, and a new milk bowl and, and spoon. So he does carving as well, by the sound of it, because those the milk bowl and spoon are things that you whittle, you carve to make the shape instead of taking flat pieces of timber and then fastening them together. <coughs> Sorry. The grandmother listened with the greatest attention, only from time to time addressing her daughter. Do you hear that, Brigitte? Do you hear what she is saying about uncle? The conversation was suddenly interrupted by a heavy thump on the door and in marched Peter, who stood stock still, opening his eyes with astonishment when he caught sight of Heidi. Then his face beamed with smiles as she called out, Good evening, Peter. What? Is the boy back from school already? exclaimed the grandmother in surprise. I have not known an afternoon to pass so quickly as this one for years. How is the reading getting on, Peter? As usual, Peter was Peter's answer. The old woman gave a little sigh. Ah, oh, well, she said, I hoped you would have something different to tell me by this time as you're going to be 12 years old this February. What was it you hoped he would have to tell you? asked Heidi, interested in all the grandmother said. I mean that he ought to have learnt to read a bit by now, continued the grandmother. Up there on the shelf is an old prayer book with beautiful songs in it which I, I have not heard for a long time and ca cannot now remember to repeat to myself, and I hoped that Peter would soon learn enough to be able to read one of them to me sometimes, but he finds it too difficult. Heidi now jumped up from her low chair and holding out her hand hastily to the grandmother said, Good night, grandmother. It is getting dark. I must go home at once. And bidding goodbye to Peter and his mother, she went towards the door. But the grandmother called out in an anxious voice, Wait, wait, Heidi, you must not go alone like that. Peter must go with you. Have you got something warm to put round your throat? I have not anything to put on, called back Heidi, but I am sure I shall not be cold. And with that she ran outside and went off at such a pace that Peter had difficulty in overtaking her. The children had taken but a few steps before they saw the grandfather coming down to meet them, and in another minute his long strides had brought him to their side. That's right, Heidi, you have kept your word, said the grandfather, and then wrapped the sack firmly round her. Wrapping the sack firmly round her, he lifted her in his arms and strode off with her up the mountain. They had no sooner got inside the hut than Heidi at once began. Grandfather, tomorrow we must take the hammer and the long nails and fasten grandmother's shutter and drive in a lot more nails in other places for her house shakes and rattles all over. We must, must we? Who told you that? said her grandfather. Nobody told me, but I know it all. F I know it for all that, replied Heidi, for everything is giving way, and when the grandmother cannot sleep, she lies trembling, for she thinks that every minute the house will fall down on their heads, and everything now is dark for the grandmother, and she does not think anyone can make it light for her again, but you will be able to, I am sure, grandfather. Tomorrow we must go and help her. We will, won't we, grandfather? The child was clinging to the old man and looking up at him in trustful confidence. The grandfather looked down at Heidi for a while without speaking, then said, Yes, Heidi, we will do something to stop the rattling. At least we can do that. We will go down about it tomorrow. 
the child went skipping around the room for joy, crying out, We shall go tomorrow, we shall go tomorrow. The grandfather kept his promise. On the following afternoon, he brought the sleigh out again. And as on the previous day, he set Heidi down at the door to the grandmother's hut and said, Go in now, and when it grows dark, come out again. Then he put the sack in the sleigh and went round the house. Heidi had hardly opened the door and sprung into the room when the grandmother called out from her corner, It's the child again! Here she comes! Heidi ran to her and then quickly drew the little stool close up to the old woman and, seated her, seating herself upon it, began to talk, tell and ask her all kinds of things. All at once came the sound of heavy blows against the wall of the hut and Grandmother gave such a start of alarm that she nearly upset the spinning wheel and cried in a trembling voice, Oh my God, now it is coming, the house is going to fall upon us. But Heidi caught her by the arm and said soothingly, No, no, Grandmother, do not be frightened. It is only Grandfather with his hammer. He is mending up everything so that you shan't have to have such fear and trouble. Is it possible? Is it really possible? So the dear God has not forgotten us, exclaimed the Grandmother. Do you hear, Brigitte, what that noise is? Did you hear what the child says? Go outside, Brigitte, and ask, and if it is Alm Uncle... Tell him he must come inside a moment that I may thank him. Brigitte went outside and found Elm Uncle in the act of fastening some heavy pieces of new wood along the wall. She stepped up to him and said, Good evening, Uncle. Mother and I thank you for doing us such a kind service, and she would like to tell you herself how great, grateful she is. I do not know who else would have done it for us. We shall not forget your kindness, for I am sure... That will do, the old man said the old man, interrupting her. I know what you think of Alm, Uncle, without you tell, your telling me. Go indoors again. I can find out for myself where the mending is wanted. Brigitte obeyed on the spot, for Uncle had a way with him that made few people care to oppose his will. He went on knocking with his hammer all round the house, then mounted the narrow steps to the roof and hammered away there until he had used up all the nails he had brought with them. Meanwhile, it had been growing dark, and he had hardly come down from the roof and dragged the sleigh out from behind the goat shed when Heidi appeared outside. The grandfather wrapped her up and took her in his arms, as he had done the day before, for although he had to drag the sleigh up the mountain after him, he feared that if the child sat in it alone, her, sat in it alone, her wrappings would fall off, and that she would be nearly, and that she would be nearly, if not quite frozen. So he carried her warm and safe in his arms. So the winter went by. After many years of joyless life, the blind grandmother at, had at last found something to make her happy. She listened for the little tripping footstep as soon as the day had come. And when she heard the door open and knew the child was really there, she would call out, God be thanked, she has come again. And Heidi had also grown very fond of the old grandmother. And when at last she knew for certain that no one could make it light for her again, she was overcome with sorrow. But the grandmother told her again that she felt the darkness much less when Heidi was with her, and so every fine winter's day the child came travelling down in her sleigh. The grandfather always took her, never raising any objection. Indeed, he always carried the hammer and sundry other things down in the sleigh with him, and many an afternoon was spent by him, in making the goat herd's cottage sound and tight. It no longer groaned and rattled the whole night through, and the grandmother, who for many winters had not been able to sleep in peace as she did now, said she could never forget what the uncle had done for her. And that's the end of that chapter and today's readings, today's story. There you go. Do you remember those things happening? I vaguely do, but that's the problem with having read something such a long time ago is it's hard to remember all the different things that happened in the story. Funny that, isn't it? Anyway, so I'm reading this live on Twitch and some of you are watching this live on Twitch. Some of you may be watching this after I've read it live on Twitch while it's still up there for two weeks. 
What happens to the stories after I've read them on Twitch? Two weeks afterwards is they appear over on YouTube. And I put them into playlists on YouTube so you can listen to a whole book in one playlist. You can take your time, you can listen to it as fast or as slow as you want to, but they're not gone even though they're no longer on Twitch. There you go. So I'm going to give you the link for my channel on YouTube. There it is there. So that you can actually see those stories. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you don't even have to go looking, following that link for the channel. You just have to click on my name that's underneath the video. And there you are. You're already in my channel. And after that, you go across the tabs underneath the first picture part and it will say playlists and that's the section that shows you what the different books are that I have read and what you can listen to. Just remember that if you miss a day here you'll have to wait two, if you don't catch it on Twitch you'll have to wait two weeks so that you can see it on YouTube but you can still see it. They're not gone. They're not forgotten. Um, also, I'm hoping at some stage to start getting pictures from the different stories that we read put up where people can see them on our Discord server. And I will give you the link for that too. So you're welcome to join it. I may have to approve your, your membership request. I don't know. But once you're a part of the group, if you find any pictures that are specifically to do with the book that we're reading, share them there. And I'm trying to start a, sec um, a new part of the, the U Discord server where it's got different channels for the different books that we're reading. So you'll be able to actually go to the channel and see the pictures, see anyone's ideas about the stories or memories that they have. You're welcome to share memories that you have of the first time you, you heard a story, a particular, that particular story or... If you've ever been to any of the places that are in the story or any little stories that you have about the story that we've read. And also there's a general place there where you can chat with others, which hasn't really been happening much. But if you go over there and join our Discord server and start talking, you might find that others start talking too. So here's the link for that. There's the Discord server. And... I shall see you next time, and I hope you have a marvellous time in between now and then. In the meantime, look for things that you enjoy, that give you pleasure, that aren't causing problems with anything for anybody, but are just nice things, and appreciate them. It doesn't have to be getting something or doing something. I have three little friends that sit with me, when I read my books, I have a little squishy seal and I have a little Christmas penguin and I have a little wee, <laughs> a little wee unicorn cat, rainbow unicorn cat. And those are things that give me great pleasure because they just sit there and they smile nicely at me and they remind me that there are nice fun things in the world that don't cost a lot that you can enjoy. Stories are one of them. Anyway, so we'll see you next time.